for the computer to be all right and everything. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to New Life Church, whether you're in person or online. I'm Jimmy, the pastor of New Life, and I'm really glad you're here and or tuning in. And as always, I like to start with a discussion question just to get our make sure we're awake and thinking about stuff. So being the 4th of July, traditional 4th of July food is hot dogs. So question today, what's your favorite hot dog topping? And I'll be looking online too to see what your answers are as well. Mustard. Mustard. Yeah. The pineapple salsa you made. They, I made a pineapple relish a few years ago that was really good, yeah. Jeff, what, what's the Chicago dog have? Yeah, what what are the yeah, Chicago dogs? Tomatoes and sport pepper, celery salts, sesame bun, all these hot dogs. And that neon green relish. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm a purist, and being from Chicago, definitely cannot have ketchup on it. My wife will argue on that, and I guess I can't really be offended if somebody likes something different than me, even if they're wrong. But <laughs> Hey, it's Independence Day, so you're free. You celebrate your freedom to choose whatever hot dog topping you like. Sometimes I like a good chili dog, too. Those, oh, man, with like homemade, can't be that canned junk. But I love a good cookout and gathering and getting people together. And hey, today's a great day to do it. So last week, I talked about being the salt of the earth. They came passage came right after the Beatitudes where Jesus was speaking to a crowd and he was telling people blessed are the people that do these things and they're completely opposite of what traditional people, what we would normally think of for being blessed. Blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. You know, all these kind of things that basically were characteristics of Jesus and he was saying to Live that way. Be the blessing on the world. And then he continued by saying, you're the salt to the earth. And we talked about that a little bit. I encourage you to tune in to our videos on Facebook if you missed it or on YouTube as well. But he diagnosed two main issues, problems in the world. He, when he talked about the salt and the light, there were two main things. First thing was spiritual decay, and as we learned last week, salt gives flavor, it is a preservative to stop decay, and it creates a thirst. So being salt is a good thing. We should all be, we're called to be salt. And then the second thing he told about was being the light. And the light is the remedy for spiritual darkness, which is today's passage. It addresses the solution of the, the, the need for light in the world. It comes from Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. And we don't have it on the screen today, but you can turn your Bibles to there if you want, or you can just listen along. I always got distracted when I used to look at the Bible, and I start looking at other things when the preacher was saying to do something. I'm better off if I'm actually paying attention. So whatever works for you, go for it. We're in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Oh, time out, time out. Wait a minute, Jimmy. I know you preached before saying that Jesus said he's the light of the world, right? You've all heard that maybe? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And now you're saying that we're the light. So which one is it? Answer, yes. <laughs> Jesus said he's the light of the world. And in John 8, 12, he talks about that a little bit more. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Boom. Okay, we should be done here, right? No. Jesus wasn't finished then. He said, whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So, yes, it's true that Jesus is the light. But he follows up by saying that his followers, those that receive the light of Jesus, become the light. And in, in his final week on earth, before he knew he was going to be crucified. Jesus already knew he was going to be crucified. He told his followers he was going to be crucified. And he spoke to them. He told them what was going to happen. He, in John 13, 35 through 36, he said, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, 
before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know that they does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. So yes, Jesus is the light of the world while he's present. He was present on earth, he was the light of the world. But he foretold, he said, I'm going to be leaving soon. I'm going to be going to heaven, making a place for you, preparing for you to be join me in heaven. He left us in charge. He left us as light bearers, in charge of shining the light to change the world in which we live. We're not just supposed to be hanging out and getting by and sort of coasting through life. We're called to do something. We're called to change the world, to bear the light of Jesus in every situation that we go to. Until he returns, we're the bearers of his light. Apart from him, we have no light. We're darkness. But in him, we're called to continue the mission. We're called to bear the light in the dark world. Church followers are reflections of Jesus. We don't possess any light. We reflect the light of Jesus. As he shines upon us, we're to shine upon the world. So what does light do? We're all familiar with light, but what does it do? The main thing is light illuminates. It pierces the darkness, which displays the truth. The truth in this situation, the truth of spiritual light is, we display the truth to the world, that you need to be made right with God, that man is sinful. We need to reconcile with God. Before Jesus came, sin separated us from God. We had to go through all kinds of crazy rituals. I'm glad I wasn't there around then, you know, where you had to sacrifice animals and spread blood and all this gross stuff. And we had, people had to do that to be able to even just get God's ear, to please him, to be forgiven of sin. But Jesus came and became sin, took on our sins and paid the penalty of death, which we all deserve because we are sinful people before Jesus. He defeated death on the cross and he's a risen Lord. In him, we are able to be made right. And as a reflection of Jesus, we become the light of the world. We share the gospel, which is to point to Jesus. The light exposes the truth of our need. And that's only met through Jesus. Apart from the grace of Jesus, the destiny it may not be a popular opinion. It may not be popular to talk about. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't have Jesus, if you have not received his grace and been forgiven of your sins, you're destined to hell. Separation eternally from Jesus. The light of Jesus is the only way to salvation. And we, as his light bearers, shine that truth on the world. Light reveals and exposes. It exposes dangers. I remember when I was a kid, we had a place up in Michigan, and I was at, we, a bunch of us guys were at a friend's house who lived sort of outside of the regular community where the rest of us had a place, and we were taking a shortcut from his place to our place, which was through the woods. And all of a sudden, I guess they probably had talked about it beforehand, they ditched me in the middle of the dark woods, which I've been through hundreds of times before, but in the dark, you don't see the obstacles that are in front of you. In the dark, the tree, I face planted into the trees, I fell, I tripped, I twisted my ankle in holes that I walked around hundreds of times before. I, it took me so long to get through, I, because the, even the trees covered the light, blocked out the light so that it was pitch black, I couldn't see. And I mean, it took me a long time, and it took me an even longer time to forgive those dudes for doing that to me. But even if, like today, at least I would have had a cell phone, which could give a little bit of light. A little bit of light brings enough vision to where you can see the dangers, you can see the obstacles that are in front of you. You can see where you may fall. You get it? A little bit of light. You can be that little bit of light. You're called to be that little bit of light in a dark world. The light of Jesus pierces spiritual darkness. It exposes those obstacles, just the same as the trees that were in front of me and the holes that, were, that I fell in. The things that can cause us to stumble, the dangers, the light of 
Jesus Christ can expose those things and show where some a friend, a family member, somebody is headed for danger, headed for a fall. The light of Jesus in us guides us to guides them to safety. It points to God. Psalm one nineteen Psalm one nineteen one oh five says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus brings light into the world. Light exposes that which was intended to be hidden. The things that we don't want anybody to know about, or that we do in secret and privacy in private, the light of Jesus exposes those things. John 3, 19 through 20 says, and this is the commendation. The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Light exposes the deeds, the things that we're doing that we want to keep hidden, that other people are doing that they want to keep hidden. Nobody likes to be shown that they're doing wrong. Nobody likes to be told, you messed up, you're doing the wrong thing. It's, not, it's never fun. I hate being told when I've done something wrong, when it's pointed out. I, I can't stand it. And our first reaction is usually to get angry, right? Jesus Christ's followers are called to be the light that shines on the darkness, exposes those things. We need to take a stand against sin and against social injustice. Not just refuse to participate, but refuse to allow it in our presence. I want to add a note of caution to that, though. We need to speak the truth in love. When we see somebody doing something wrong, first of all, we need to pray about it before we even speak. Because you want to make sure that you're still operating within the parameters that God has laid out for us. We, we speak the truth in love. And like a moth drawn to a flame, that's how people should be towards the light of God. If we're just completely turning them off and pushing them away, that's not what we're called to do. Because here's the thing. I was praying about this in the shower this morning. We're called to be the light. We're not called to be the prosecutor. We're not called to be the judge. Jesus said in John 16, 8, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict them of their sins. It's not our job. We can point it out, but it's not our job to tell them what they have to do. We can tell them how to get out of that situation, how to stop those things, but it's not our job to hold it against them. And once they've confessed of their sins and asked for forgiveness, we need to forgive them, just as Jesus has forgiven them. We are the light. We have to do the things that Jesus has done. But that also means we don't water down the truth. We don't pull any punches when it comes to things that are happening in our world, in our community, in our town, in our household especially. People say they love, people say that, I'm sorry, people love to sin. I'm sorry, but if you don't know Jesus, you love to do what pleases you. They hate the light and they want to extinguish it. We're to shine like a city on the hill for everyone to see. We need to declare salvation in Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. Jesus spoke, continued about light. I stopped right in, after one verse there. Verse 15, he said, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, you know, when you think about it today, I got a light here, you know, put it under a basket, yeah, it doesn't do much, not very good, it doesn't do really anything, but it's okay, I get enough light from it, that's all that matters, but you ever think about in the day of Jesus, what that, what that meant, there was, a, the light wasn't, you know, something that you plug into your computer and it charges and you get the get a light from it for a certain amount of time. It was 
a lantern that was made out of clay and had oil in it and a, fl a wick and flame. So you think about that. If it was under here, do you ever like even just put your hand over a candle? You know, it it gets warm after a while. Well, if you have a, a basket, which in Jesus' day was a, they were common baskets that were used for measuring grain. If you put a basket over that lantern, eventually it's going to start getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And at some point, it most likely could cause the basket to start on fire, which then in turn could possibly burn down the whole house, a.k.a. destroy destruction. destroy. It could destroy everything that's around that light. When we're called to bear the light of Jesus, first of all, we're not supposed to hide it. Because when we hide the light, we're operating contrary to our intended design. We're, we're created to be the light of Jesus. And it becomes dangerous and destructive. It can flame out, even hiding it within the church. We can flame out because we do no good. We're called to be a city on a hill so that the whole city, or a light on a hill, so the whole city can see it. We're not called to be undercover Christians and just shine in our basket of the four walls. We're, we're called to go out and give the light to others. The purpose of light is to show the way, show the world, the Father in heaven, which, as a preacher, if it doesn't convict me, there's something wrong with me. Because we're called, our preacher is called to not avoid the hard truth. Even when it ain't pretty, even when it's offensive, hopefully I can speak the truth in love. But we're not called to cast a wide net where nobody's offended. Where everybody, anything, oh, it's okay sweetie, that's all right. God loves you anyway. We're not called to just tell people you can keep on doing the things you're doing. We're called to preach that Jesus is the only way and only through him is there salvation. I'm certain that church, the big capital C church as in the, all the churches combined is suffering as a result of preachers who are afraid of preaching the truth, that sin is sin. They use the excuse that, but we have to love them. Well, I'm sorry, but if that's, you're watering down the truth, you're pulling punches, you're not telling people that sin is sin, you're loving them right into hell. And as a church body, we need to be that light. We need to go out with that light. We need to spread that light where we go. We don't want to have the attitude, well, they know where we are. 10 o'clock on Sundays, the doors are always open. Be there, be square. We need to challenge our thinking of even what it means to be a church and have a church service. Whether it's our, the way where we meet, our traditions, having a piano, or a grand piano in the corner. I was watching, Cheryl had some some preachers on this morning on one of the Christian channels. I was sat down, was watching it while I was drinking my coffee. And they were saying some good stuff, but I thought about it. Somebody my age or younger tuning in, first thing they see is a stuffy old dude in a three-piece suit. It's like, I'm sorry, I got nothing in common with them, right? If you're somebody that has not received light, that you don't know Jesus. I'm not saying, you know, wear cutoffs and a tank top, but we need to even challenge how we how we come, how we dress, what we do. If we're turning somebody out because they think that they they aren't going to fit in because they come to church and they don't have the right clothes, we have to think about that. What are we doing? We have to be flexible. I'm not talking about flexible with the word, about the flexible with the truth. There's pillars of the church that can never change. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. But if we're not flexible, 
how are we going to reach the lost? What if it was proven that through studies and surveys and church, you know, whoever, that Barna group and those people that do that stuff, it's proven that churches reach more people by meeting on Friday night. Are we willing to change? Or are we so tied in to tradition that we can't change what makes us comfortable? And if that's the case, the question has to be asked, who are we glorifying? We need to be flexible and shine our light for the world to see. And in order for us to light the world, we have to have an honest evaluation of ourselves. Am I living in the light? Am I living in the ways that Jesus has called me to live? Because Satan is the prince of the world. <clears throat> prince of the world. He hates us as God's masterpieces. He wants to destroy us. And it's usually not going to be just some giant bomb that goes off or some terrible thing that happens. I mean, that can happen. But most of the time, the easiest way that he can change and help us to lose the value of being God's masterpiece is if he convinces us to walk with the world, to do the same things the world is doing, to blend in with the world. Oh, you're okay. Those are just tiny things. You don't have to worry about those things. Just keep on doing those things. Well, the tiny things start getting bigger and bigger and snowballing. And we think, oh, but, but I'm good. I, I go to church. I was baptized. I said the magic words when I was a kid. First John 1 verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, God, and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So how can we be certain that we're walking in the light? Because we have to walk in the light in order to be light bearers. For starters, we have to be plugged into the source of light, which is Jesus. We have to be studying, praying, listening to him, and attending church. Or viewing it online. You know, I have to be flexible and trust that God's word can be spread through online services. We have to have so much more than just once a week, Sunday morning. Getting the word, if that's our only source of the light and receiving the light, I ain't going to cut it. We don't enter a battle unprepared and unarmed. Yet so many times, the only word or prayer and praying that anybody does is on Sundays. If I only had a meal like today, we met together and had, had breakfast together and that was the only food I had the entire week, I would be weak. I would be starving. I'd be so hungry and not being able, I mean, when I go without food for a little while, my brain is really foggy and I can't even concentrate. If we're not getting spiritually fed, if we're not taking the time to be in God's word and learning from it, we're not spiritually fed and our spiritual bodies become weak. We need to be around the bearers of the light, the church body, people, other Christians. We need to spend time with them. There's a place in Alaska called Utikaliki, something like that, in Alaska. It's known as the darkest place on earth. It, 65 days, every year, there's a stretch of 65 days where it's night. The sun doesn't rise. It's a nighttime for 65 days. And the police have reported this. There's a higher percentage of suicides, depression, substance abuse as a result of that darkness, not being in the light. And the one way that they've learned to cope with that darkness is going to church, spending time with the church body. We need to be around others. And if, have you ever thought about it? It's like that Coca old Coca-Cola commercial. I'd like to teach the world to say in perfect harmony. And one person has a candle. And then somebody joins in. And somebody else with a candle. And more and more people with a candle. And suddenly, dozens of people together with candles makes the light brighter than it was when it was just one candle in a dark room. We need to combine our candles in this community 
to light the world to point to Jesus. Have you ever thought about the story in Exodus where Moses was in the presence of Jesus? He went in to see Jesus and or God, and God said, you couldn't handle it. But let me see. Please, God, let me see. And he said, okay, fine. Stand up on the mountain inside this little nook in the rocks. Stand here, and I'll pass by. And when God passed by, Moses only saw the train of his robe, and his face was glowing. Like the, the people, when he went back down off the mountain, they were like, Moses, hide your face. It's too bright. Because he spent time with with God. He, the light of God was shining in him. But eventually, after some time, that faded. I want to make sure that the light inside me of God does not fade. That I'm spending time with the Lord so that I shine for the world to see. I want to be shining all day, every day. Light banishes the darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. We point our way to him. We're the witnesses in the things we say and the things we do. If we fail to help others discover him, the world remains in darkness and cannot thrive. James said, faith without works is dead. So are we dead? Are we mostly dead? Are we on life support? Being salty, like we talked about last week, creates opportunities to do good works. Jesus said, when you do the good works, you're shining the light for the world to see. In order for light to penetrate darkness, it has to be allowed to shine. We must carry the light of Jesus where we go. So, are you shining? Are we being intentional on how we shine the light? Jesus said to let your light shine. We need to look for opportunities to let that light shine through service through the gifts, the talents, possessions we have, the abilities. Have you ever thought about that? The things that God has given you, whether it's money, whether it's a talent and a certain ability, or just something you love to do. Like me, I love to cook. I have money that God has given me. God gave me these things so that I can shine my light on this world, which is his light on the world. It's nice to have stuff. It's nice to have time to do stuff, but if I'm hoarding my time, my possessions, my abilities, again, who am I glorifying? We become more like Jesus when we serve. The Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. So, could we, should we expect any less of ourselves than to be his servant? Now, the reminder is the purpose. Jesus said, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The goal is not to make me look good. To have a certain number of followers on Instagram, on Facebook. That's not the goal. The goal, think about this, because this is going to rock your world. The goal is not even to fill these pews at New Life Church. Because Jesus said that we must be driven by glorifying the Father. Granted, people come to church, they meet him, they get to know him, and they have a relationship with Jesus, and they can be saved. But the goal is not to fill this building. The goal, the end game is for them to receive Jesus wherever that is. We don't we don't stop doing or, or not do something just because, well, there's not going to be enough return on my investment here because, you know, I studied this and this event, we spend this X number of dollars so we should have X number of visitors and people that come to the church. What if we're thinking about just glorifying the Father and planting the seeds in people. We don't have to see the end result. We are called to plant those seeds so that others will see the Father and be and glorify the Father. And like I said, more light makes us more visible. As a body, we should be able to 
illuminate Rochelle. So the question is, are you ready to get those lights shining? To get that light going so that Rochelle sees it, so that this city sees it. Well, I got something good to tell you. We have an opportunity for that. We don't always have to like think outside the box. So I guess sometimes I think a little outside the box. But this coming Saturday, Rochelle is doing Hot Dog Day. And a few years ago, I had this crazy thought, what if we did that? What if we just gave out hot dogs for people and maybe some water and just be a blessing to the community through something that's already established? Turns out we were the only church that ever thought of that, evidently. And I'm like, how cool is that? We get to do Hot Dog Day again this year. We're doing it, you know, we're starting it. It's serving from 11 to 2, I think I said. Yep. And so I'll be talking to a few of you about coming earlier, but we have an opportunity. So we can, we can look at this as, oh, man, Jimmy signed us up for some more junk to do, more work to do, more stuff that we got to do. Or we can think about it as, yes, I have an opportunity to share the love of God with every single person that comes in here. And I'm telling you, it seems like all of Rochelle comes to get a free hot dog. And, and most of them will go to just about every location. What if we're the one location that they come to where they leave feeling like, man, those people really love me. I get serious I'm thinking about it. What if somebody leaves this place next Saturday thinking, man, they just... All they wanted was to serve. It's not about getting, you know, building a business, making money, or making a profit, anything like that. What if they just want to serve? They love people. This could be, Saturday could be the first page in someone's salvation story. That's how we have to look at it. And if not us, who? If we're not shining the light, who's influencing the world? Who's influencing Rochelle? He's called us to do the work, to point to the source of light, to point to salvation. As light, we are something different for the world. We are something, we provide something the world desperately needs as salt and light that Jesus called us to be. As salt, we prevent spiritual decay. As light, we cure spiritual blindness. Jesus has called us to participate in the message. I close with this verse, Acts 24, verse 47. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. How will you answer that call? God, I thank you that you've called us to be more than just pew warmers, more than just a cool bunch of people that hangs out together. That you've called us to a job. I don't want to just sit around and be a pew potato. <laughs> I like that. I don't want to be a pew potato, though. God, I want to do things, be active, and heed and obey your call to be a light to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stop the video, please?